for computer-assisted legal instruction. And welcome to week eight of topics in digital law practice. The topic this week is unauthorized practice of law in the 21st century. There's my smiling face of a picture just taken a few seconds ago. I always like to provide a, uh, a, uh, a vice age to go along with this disembodied voice. I want to remind everybody that there is no uh, official CLE credit offered for this course. We haven't made any arrangements with any states or with any entities. I understand that there are some uh, states that allow for self-reporting. That's wonderful, but that's entirely uh, your responsibility as far as that goes. I want to remind you also that the goals of this course are to give students uh, access to up-to-date information about, uh, about, you know, about the technology changes that are happening inside of all law practice. And um, we have quite a number of law faculty who are either attending or, or viewing the videos uh, afterwards, and we want to inform them about the changing nature of law practice uh, so that that filters back into their teaching to make it more relevant. Um, another goal is to create an enduring resource. In other words, all, everything that we do on this class is being recorded and archived and posted um, so that uh, future students and, for that matter, future instructors who might refer to this material can find it. And, um, and the solution is, we, uh, is, is the format of a MOOC, a massive online open course. <clears throat> Pardon me. So here's the uh, websites, uh, tdlpclasscaster.net. That's the blog for the course. You can remember, uh, drop comments there or questions. tdlp.wikispaces.com is where the homework wiki is. You can go there, and if you haven't already um, uh, registered, you could request to join the wiki, and uh, pretty quickly I will approve you. The hashtag, if you are tweeting about this on Twitter, is tdlp. Um, and, and, and both Cali Org and myself, John P. Mayer, and those are our Twitter handles. Um, when there's any news or new things about the course, we tweet. And so you could uh, follow those two uh, entities to keep up to date. So we give out badges for completing the homework. Um, uh, some of you are, 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 have been wonderful and diligent in completing every, every homework as it comes up. That's great. That means you're getting the full benefit of this course. Uh, others of you less so. I, I urge you to uh, check out the homework. Practice makes perfect. Practice gives you greater uh, access to the information and greater understanding about what we're talking about. You cannot just sit and passively learn. You must actually do some things. And so that's why we do, the, we do assign the homeworks. The homework badge for week eight is that. It's a, it's a red flag. Um, I think that's a particularly appropriate uh, badge uh, symbol for the unauthorized practice of law. Remember, if you have questions, this is a, a blow up of what it looks like. You can drop the questions in there, and after uh, our speaker is done, we'll uh, try to get those questions answered. We also post those questions back to the wiki. And uh, we uh, try to get the speaker to come in and uh, answer them um, if, if he's uh, got the time. And this week, our speaker is Will Hornsby. Now, Will, there's a picture of Will. Uh, Will, it was, uh, it was tricky finding a, a bio for you um, that was absolutely up to date. And so uh, I, I do know that you were staff counsel at the uh, American Bar Association. I know you've got um, many, 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 many years of experience in this space. And I've seen you speak on it a couple of times, um, and I think uh, I think it's you know unauthorized practice of law sounds like it might be one of those sort of dry uh, topics, um, and uh, and yet when you get when you mix it in with uh, social media or virtual law practice, um, I think I think it gets exciting all over again. Does, does that make any sense to you? Will? Did I lose Will? Okay, I'm going to see if I can uh, find out what's going on with uh, technical problems. We'll be right back. Uh, we've lost your audio.
Well, in the meantime, I'm going to take the presentation back and fill the the a few moments with uh, with um, where am I? With looking at the homework. Maybe I can like uh, save save us some time by going over the homework um, at this point, and so we don't actually lose any any time. On the on the hour, we like to uh, as much as possible keep up with that. All right, and the, um, uh, Elmer. What I'm going to ask you to do is take a look. Uh, make sure you keep an eye on the attendee list in case uh, Will shows up as an attendee because it's uh, he, when he came in the first time he wasn't an attendee, and I had to uh, make him a panelist so that I could uh, hand the screen over to him. So the homework is uh, is is going to be the following. Um, what I want you to do is uh, find the definition for unauthorized practice of law for your jurisdiction, wherever you're at, and you know, and at least one other state, and uh, read it, obviously. And then I want you to put the links that you found to that definition into your homework wiki. Okay, that should be pretty easy and pretty straightforward. I'm not thinking that's, uh, that's going to stress you too much. Um, a little more difficult, though, is I want you to find three news articles or blog posts uh, on the web uh, describing actual cases of unauthorized practice of law and read them. And that's pretty straightforward or, or, or that's doable. Um, but, but I want you to do something that's a little bit harder. I want you to look especially for situations where the unauthorized practice of law involved in online activity you know, like a website or a um, or a um, uh, social network or electronic mail or advertising on a website uh, or or something like that. Um, I looked around and, and and it was actually difficult to find um, sort of those types of examples of unauthorized practice of law. Um, but I want you to see if you can find any of those um, because they're more relevant to the topic at hand. The, you know, uh, digital law practice, and, uh, and and link them up from your from your homework wiki, and so that's the homework, and that's what we're going to uh, assign to you, and we've just saved that five minutes from the end of the class, and I see that Will has uh, dialed back in, but uh, the audio yet on his hasn't kicked back in, and so give us a moment, and we'll. Will, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Ah, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Excellent. I'm going to make you the presenter now. All right. I'm going to... All right. And I can, yep, and I can see your screen. Um, Sorry about I, that, folks. Yeah, things, really. things go wrong. <laughs> All right. Let's get right into it then. Um, first thing, I've got my own disclaimer, which is that... Um, Nothing I say should be deemed the policies of the ABA or any of its constituent entities, and that enables me to continue on as a staff counsel at the ABA and, and hopefully gives me some latitude in the types of things I'm going to talk about today, um, just in case there is anything that's not perfectly consistent with the ABA philosophy. Second thing is, you know, John, I want to, I, I know we just lost a little bit of time, but I want to take some, uh, take 30 seconds and say thank you to you for putting this course on. I've attended almost all of the sessions, and they are outstanding. And I, I hope that you will continue uh, with MOOCs, and, um, and I'll look forward to other presentations that uh, you're able to advance because it's really something that a, a great idea and, and executed um, so superbly on your part, and the uh, speakers are, <laughs> are really folks of high quality. So I, I, you don't get enough good feedback on this, I'm sure, but I just want to take a minute to say that. So. Thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, so I'm going to talk about UPL, as the title says. I'm also going to expand this a little bit and hopefully be able to keep within our time frame. I want to talk about what I call ethics. They're, techni they're ethics that apply to the technology that we use. And I'm going to obviously um, not have a, a lot of time to go into the details on that, but I want people to understand and I know both Stephanie, uh, I know Richard Granite um, uh, touched on on these things, um, and, and uh, I want to expand on that a little bit. Now I want to spend a couple minutes at the end of the program, kind of giving you my vision of the future. 
Um, as I talk about the UPL things in particular, I might sound confusing. I might sound incoherent. There's one of two possibilities there. One is that I am in fact incoherent, and the other is we just lack the basis to know what we're uh, dealing with and how it applies, how, how at best 20th century policy applies to 21st century uh, forms of communication with our delivery of legal services. So um, there can well be questions at the end of this program that I have no idea about and probably no one has any idea about. And if other people have ideas that I haven't come upon yet, I look forward to hearing those as well. One thing I want us to keep in the back of our mind as we look at some of these issues is the functions of lawyering. And I create and, and the dichotomy that I that makes sense to me as we use technology is to uh, is to have one segment uh, of dispute resolution and another of compliances. You know, in practice, practices are divided into transactional and litigation, and that parallels this a little bit. But actually, when we think about the uh, different functions of law, many of them, uh, functions of lawyering, many of them have both of these functions. So, for example, in a, uh, a divorce, you've got the compliances with the pleading, and you've got the dispute resolution, the litigation part of that. So um, when we look at technology, it's focused fundamentally uh, today on compliances, but that's going to change as we um, have greater uh, availability of uh, as, arti as artificial intelligence uh, unfolds. We're going to see some uh, computer uh, models that are, are advancing, and we're starting to see this, advancing the dispute resolution function as well. But most of what we're going to talk about in terms of UPL has to do with compliances. And this feeds into Richard Susskind's work. You know, his book before the, um, the end of lawyer's question mark is called The Future of Law. And his conclusion at that, his vision uh, at, at the end of that book, is that lawyers will have one of two tracks to take. One is uh, to be litigators, where technology will be a support mechanism, and the other is that lawyers will be software developers. And um, nowhere does that notion play out more than the work that, that John and, and Ron Stout are doing at Kent. So at any rate, let's look at how some of that uh, interfaces with the uh, governance of that. So who are the technology uh, based, uh, who provides technology based compliances? Well, I, I think we have a range of uh, providers, one of which is uh, legal service providers that are usually corporations and, and they proliferate on, on the internet. Um, and, and we see them every day. Some of them are are uh, large and, and becoming more and more powerful. Some of them are, are mom and pop operations that provide online uh, wills and, and, and documents and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and they're direct providers. Um, then we see legal aid and I hope everybody on this uh, call uh, heard and saw what Ron Stout presented last week at the A, A, A to J authoring tool. And if you haven't, I, I encourage you to, to visit the archived um, uh, presentation of that because it's really phenomenal work and this is fundamentally being played out as document preparation services in legal aid. We also have the courts, probably one of the best kept secrets is that courts provide uh, interactive online forms in many states and it, it, people can just go on and, and get the same thing that they can also buy from a vendor but they can get them for free and, and, and make sure that they're up to date and accurate court sites. Um, and, and some of them have support mechanisms and places that you can actually talk to somebody if you're stumped with how to, how to deal with that. And it's, it's really, like I said, one of the best kept secrets. Then we have lawyers and law firms who are providing technology-based compliance, sometimes not necessarily as part of their practice, but as a, uh, an ancillary business. So let's take a look at how that plays out. Here's an example, and I just... Uh, pulled this off. There, you know, there are literally hundreds of of these kinds of things. This is one that you can either buy as a CD or you can download for home and business lawyer. Um, and I, I don't 
you know, endorse this or anything. I just use it as an example of, of the type of thing that's going on. Um, here's the A to J, uh, and, and if you didn't see it last week, you see here's an avatar, and, uh, and when you start up, you become an avatar, and you answer a series of questions that eventually marches you down to the courthouse steps where all of that information is then electronically sorted behind the wizard that John and Ron have created to make um, uh, court uh, filing ready documents. Um, and it, this is uh, transforming the document preparation for, for legal aid across the country. And then we have, like I said, um, court uh, resources. And the California courts are excellent in terms of uh, the scope of uh, documents that they provide, as well as the uh, simple interface. And, and you just fill out the forms, and there's uh, places where you can get information if you're stumped about that. But many of these are reduced to, to very simple uh, questions that the great majority of people should have you know, readily available uh, access to the to whatever the information is that's, that's necessary there. And then you just print these off, and again, ready to file. Um, and then we're seeing a little bit from from law firms of, of all sizes. This is a, a major law firm centered in St. Louis that provides a, a training package, a technology-based training package. You see in the middle paragraph here they have something called the No Zone, which is a, a training package for supervisors and employees on uh, harassment in the workplace. And people can download this information. And there's no real lawyer behind this. I mean, the lawyers are behind creating it, but once it's viewed by the viewer, it's just the same as as, as the interface that we have here over the counter for personal use. Um, and it's dealt with on a, um, a, a corporate basis for their clients. Um, so the question then is, how do these... Uh, how do these things um, relate to the practice of law and the unauthorized practice of law um, when they are provided outside of the attorney-client relationship? Now, the, some of these things can be provided within the attorney-client relationship, the things that are generated from the law firms, the things that are generated from legal aid. Other things cannot be generated um, from an attorney-client relationship. Providers, law, law, legal service providers, who are not um, uh, law firms, uh, even though the lawyers might be um, uh, directors or might be corporate officers, um, if they're provided in a form that's not a law firm, that becomes problematic. So what we need to look at is the definition of the practice of law, and we need to look at how uh, unauthorized practice of law has been interpreted. And I'm going to go through um, a series of cases uh, that over the last half century that have specifically addressed this issue. And what, what we'll see is that the cases um, have been relatively consistent in their findings, and their findings have, have proved to be obstacles for the ability of lawyers outside of the practice of law and uh, legal service providers who are not lawyers um, or, or might be corporate interests who are trying to provide these services uh, uh, on a large scale through, through technology. About 10 years ago, the ABA had an initiative to create a model definition of the practice of law. Now, it's important to note that this um, model was never adopted by the ABA House of Delegates. It became a hot-button issue, and the states came to the conclusion after the work of the commission had advanced that, they, that, that it should be a state's rights uh, uh, concern and that each state needed to have the prerogative to develop its own definition of the practice of law and that um, the ABA's assistance in that wasn't something that would be compelling to the different states. And so um, this did not advance, but they do have a model definition. It is not the policy of the ABA, but it's very instructive to us in this discussion because it is based on many of the statutory creations for the practice of law. And what I want you to take a look at are the, the um, 
one and two in the bottom of this screen where it says that it's presumed to be the practice of law when somebody engages in what they have listed out four things here. And the first two are extraordinarily broad in, in this perspective. One of the, the first one is giving advice to persons um, about their legal rights or responsibilities. Giving legal advice is, according to this, the practice of law. And again, this reflects the statutory provision that are in effect in many states. The second one can be even broader, selecting, drafting, or completing legal documents that affect the legal rights of a person. I think that that's huge um, and, and uh, extraordinarily expansive, and it is what much of uh, these document preparation services, whether they're through the courts or through the marketplace, um, or through legal aid or through a law firm, uh, it, it's much of what they do. Now, we not only have statutory definitions in the states, many of which include these provisions, but we also have case law that defines the practice of law. And what I want you to focus on here um, is the Illinois definition, the giving of advice of any sort of service by any person or entity, basically, when giving such advice uh, requires the use of any degree of legal knowledge or skill. How, how could they write this any broader? I mean, this encompasses everything. This encompasses an offer by the clerk at Best Buy for you to, to, to buy an extended warranty. And you say, what does that cover? and they give you advice from a corporate entity that uh, requires some degree of legal knowledge. Um, it, it is an incredibly broad uh, statement of uh, what the practice of law is. So anything that, that is, uh, uh, anything that is, that fits this definition that is not provided by a lawyer who is licensed to, to practice law would be uh, or could likely be deemed the unauthorized practice of law. So let me show you the Texas definition of the practice of law. And here I want you to focus on the last uh, uh, part of this. And, and I will loop back to this as it pertains to the case law. But what they have done is created an exemption for um, software, basically. And it says that uh, the, the practice of law does not include the design, creation, publication, blah, 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 um, by any means uh, for, for display or sale on the Internet, written materials, books, forms, computer software, as long as it tells you that it's not the substitute um, for a lawyer, that, that this doesn't substitute for having an attorney. So this is something that came about as an alternative resolution to one of the cases that I'm going to discuss here. So let me uh, take you back to uh, the 1960s. Uh, Norman Dacey wrote a book called How to Avoid Probate in New York. It was a, mostly in New York. It was a multi-state book, but it, it began and centered on New York because probate there was very complicated. And the New York County Bar um, prosecuted Dacey for the unauthorized practice of law. And his defense was First Amendment defense. And he said, look, I don't have clients. How can I be practicing law? And the, the court said uh, at the lower court level, too bad. It's the unauthorized practice of law. You're telling people how to do a legal service. And he won on appeal on a First Amendment claim. Uh, but the lower court said it, it was the unauthorized practice of law. If we fast forward then to the 1990s, before the Internet, uh, Parsons uh, uh, was a company that produced something called Quicken Family Services, which is off-the-shelf uh, CD that provided wills and, and other uh, legal documents. And the Texas... Uh, unauthorized practice of law committee sued Parsons and said um, this is the practice of law and Parsons defense was we don't have clients we're not practicing law we don't have any attorney client relationship we're selling software off the shelf 
And the court said, no, we think that's the unauthorized practice of law. You are helping people find forms through your technology, and you're helping them fill out, fill out those forms. And even though you don't know who they are, and even though you don't have a personal relationship with them, it's still the unauthorized practice of law. That's where this uh, revised definition of, uh, the, uh, of the practice of law, and therefore the unauthorized practice of law, comes into Texas. Their, their strategy, instead of further litigating this, instead of uh, taking appeals, was to lobby the legislature to have a definition of the practice of law that precluded what they were providing. So, so far as I know, Texas is the only jurisdiction that has this specific preclusion, um, and it's very effective for what they want to do. We go forward to the Internet, and In Ray Reynoso is a bankruptcy, is, is a case where a firm provided, a company, a corporation, provided online uh, document preparation for bankruptcies. And it marketed itself in the most heinous way. It was it really should have been a consumer protection action because it said, you know, we'll save your house, we'll save your cars, don't don't worry about your credit, um, just use our forms. And they were simple forms for for, for bankruptcy. Um, and uh, and 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 they, there was an action for unauthorized practice, and the court determined that what they provided was the unauthorized practice of law. And, and, and tellingly, they said uh, this one statement, which I, I think is a mindset that is, is horribly detrimental to those of us who are using technology to deliver legal services. And it says, um, websites don't grow out of thin air. They're put together by people. Um, it's not the website that provides the assistance. It's the people who develop the website. And they said that's who is guilty of the unauthorized practice of law. If we go forward Ugh. to uh, last year, there's the uh, Jansen versus uh, LegalZoom case. And it came up with the same conclusion that LegalZoom was, was guilty of the unauthorized practice of law. And they had language that was very similar to Renoso, although it didn't make reference to Renoso, but says a computer sitting on a desk can't prepare a legal document without a human programming it. And therefore, it's the humans who program it that are the ones who are the uh, guilty of the unauthorized practice of law. Now, it's a very interesting case, and I encourage people to you know, just keyword it on Google uh, Scholar and, and take a look at this decision because what it does, and it's similar to Renoso in this respect, but it's clearer, is it creates this distinction between legal product and legal service. And it said what, what LegalZoom was providing, specifically in this jurisdiction, not necessarily everywhere, was not a product. It wasn't a document. It was, it, it was the service of preparing the document. And what this amounts to is that the, the, the dumber the system you are offering, the more likely it is to be deemed a product which is acceptable, and the smarter and the better it is, the more likely it is to be a service. If it provides a function where it can help you find the necessary forms for your particular matter, it's more likely to be deemed a service. If it's something that simply is a book where you have to look it up and you might you might pick the wrong form, uh, then it's, it's more likely to be deemed a product. So there's a definite irony here in terms of the application of these broad rules in in these um, uh, in 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 these services that that people can access very affordably and uh, conveniently. So. Um, almost none of these services want to create an, uh, an attorney-client relationship because if they're not lawyers, um, they, they, um, uh, they face clearly the application of unauthorized practice of law when they have an attorney-client relationship. Um, and also, they um, have to comply with all of the rules that govern lawyers. So, the problem with the formation of the attorney-client relationship is that it's in the eye of the beholder. It's the potential client that uh, makes this decision, and it's based on 
a two-step analysis. What's the uh, what does the person believe the relationship to be, and is there a reasonable basis for that belief? So if you're providing legal advice to an individual who's using your technology and information to do this, there's definitely a prospect that they can have a, a uh, that they can reach a conclusion that you are their lawyer, um, even if you're just a corporate entity behind a a, a, a uh, uh, internet-based interface, uh, and if it is in fact legal advice instead of generic information, if it is smarter, if it is more helpful, um, then there, there's a greater likelihood that there's a reasonable basis for that belief, and, and that's something that can undercut entities that are providing legal services outside of the attorney-client relationship and, and actually lead to the creation of that relationship. Uh, so um, let's let's look at what happens when we use technology to provide document preparation and other resources to people within the attorney-client relationship within a law firm structure. Uh, we have a series of rules that apply, and one of those rules uh, is uh, governs the limited scope of representation. This is the unbundling that Richard Granite was talking about uh, in detail a few weeks ago. And again, if you haven't heard Richard's presentation, it was laser focused and I thought an excellent um, uh, uh, presentation on this particular issue. Document preparation um, can be done in and of itself with no other uh, service provided to an individual. Uh, under the, uh, if it's done in compliance with model rule 1.2C. Now 1.2C has two standards and it says a lawyer may limit the scope of representation as long as that limitation is reasonable under the circumstances and the client gives informed consent. Now informed consent is not that great of a hurdle when we use technology. We can just tell people, do you agree that such and such, you know, we, and, and, and have an overt um, acknowledgement of that agreement. What creates a little bit more of an obstacle is the requirement that there that it be reasonable under the circumstance. And the reason why this is an obstacle is because this is a labor intensive hands on determ individual determination. So the law firm can't just lay off the document preparation service as it could if it were done outside of the practice of law. But instead it has to make a judgment that the service is appropriate for the capabilities that the individual has. So if you think about doing this in an office setting, it's not that difficult. If you think about doing it even in a virtual law office, it's not that difficult because there's that communication, there's that interface. If you think about providing document preparation, for example, um, as legal aid um, might provide it in a, a, a broad basis available to anyone who comes to legal aid, but they don't otherwise have resources to serve those, those potential clients, then that becomes a problem where the lawyers have not had the ability to determine whether or not the offering of, this, of the discrete service is reasonable under the circumstances. Next issue is uh, confidence, and we have a very simple definition of confidence, uh, but there is a comment that goes with it that includes in that comment a duty to make inquiry. We have to, pursuant to representation, know what that legal issue is. We can't just say, um, you fit into this box without making some questions, without without an interface that involves some questions. We have a duty to inquire about what the nature of the legal problem is as part of our responsibility to give competent legal services. And again, I hope you can see how difficult that is, is when all we provide might be document preparation. The third thing is our uh, 1.3 obligation to provide diligent service. And in the comment to that, there's a requirement that we we provide zealous advocacy, and I'm I always question how can you zealously advocate the preparation of documents? Um, they are inconsistent notions with having a routine legal service uh, that um, uh, is not necessarily done 
with any particular zeal. It's something, especially when it's done through technology, it's something that might be very uh, rote it, 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 and um, the antithesis of the spoken work that Susskind talks about. So, um, and the last thing here is um, in, in, in this particular analysis is our obligations when we deal with the clients of diminished uh, capacity. And this relates both to the limited scope of representation obligation to be reasonable under the circumstance, and it relates to confidence where we have a duty to make inquiry. How do we know if the people who are going to use our forms are uh, capable of doing that in a way that's um, productive for them? How do we know that they're um, over 18? Uh, because you would have a limited capacity as a, as a minor. Uh, how do we know that they are you know, mentally capable of uh, making these decisions? Well, the only way to know that is to have some kind of interface, whether it's through email or telephone or in person. It still requires that interface that imposes these kinds of limitations. So we then have the more... Uh, you know some of the some of the core values uh, of, of the profession applying to this. We have an obligation for confidentiality. So when we are providing um, these kinds of interfaces, um, we have to make sure that there is security in that information. We don't have time to go into this in detail, and it's something that I think technologically is resolving itself, much like the um, initial conversations were with with uh, email. And I think that the vendors are, are putting um, uh, safeguards in that uh, provide that measure of protection. It's a reasonable measure. And finally, there's the obligation to check conflict. So if we have um, uh, an ancillary business that's providing legal, that's providing document preparation, for example, it um, uh, may not have an obligation to do a conflicts check, but if we're providing that document preparation within the scope of representation, then we do have that. And if you're doing high volume work, uh, there's quite likely a uh, potential for conflicts that needs to be identified before the uh, client goes forward with accessing the information. And finally, there's a uh, duty of candor toward the tribunal, which has been invoked uh, for ghostwriting, uh, where people who, lawyers who provide ghostwritten documents are uh, sanctioned because they fail to disclose that they have done that, and that becomes uh, something that is a violation of the uh, candor toward the tribunal. This has not worked particularly well um, for uh, for, for um, uh, uh, a, as a sanction, it has a, basically the courts say, well, you have to tell us this, but then they don't go on to sanction because the exact wording of its model rule 3.3 in the collateral state rules, um, it, it, the exact wording of it doesn't neatly govern this, but the courts sometimes get uh, bent out of shape when uh, lawyers submit um, ghostwritten materials, and that obviously can be done through the technological interface. So when we look at this analysis, we want to say to ourselves, can we avoid UPL? Can we work outside of the definitions of the practice of law? Well, in Texas, that's not a difficult thing to do. In Illinois, it's extraordinarily difficult. So it really de depends on what your definition of the practice of law is in the states in which you, you're providing these services. And then there, there's a question, is there a difference between services in the marketplace and those for the public good? Every case has to do, every case I showed you has to do with the um, services being provided in the marketplace. And if you read In Ray Reynoso, oh my God, they come down on, on, on these service providers and like I said, it's a matter, it should have been a case of consumer protection because of the misrepresentations they made, but they're very harsh uh, on um, these services when they're provided in the marketplace outside of the actual practice of law that includes those um, obligations to comply with all of the rules. On the other hand, when it's done for legal aid, when it's done through the courts, never heard of a court being accused of, of uh, unauthorized practice of law, and I suspect I never will. Nevertheless, they're doing the same things that when it's done in the marketplace can be, uh, can be something that's condemned, and there is no uh, direction on why there are those distinctions. There's, there's nothing that has 
uh, told us that it's inappropriate when it's done for public good, as we, as some of the courts have concluded, it is inappropriate in the marketplace. So how then do we control the determination of the client relationship is another question we want to ask. If we want to avoid these, uh, the, the um, client relation, attorney, lawyer, client relationship, we need to take steps that make it um, clear to the potential client that it, it, it is not doing that, but we do that at the detriment of, of being accused of providing, uh, or, 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 of violating UPL rules. Um, and so if we work within the attorney-client relationship, then the question becomes how do we fully comply? How do we use this cost effectively, use this technology to do document preparation and other interfaces that fully comply with these rules that I've listed out? So I know I only have a couple minutes left before we get to some questions, but I want to talk to you about a possible future. You know, there are many uh, people who deal with the future call it futures because there are many futures and we try to invent these futures. But I want to think about a conversion uh, from 2D text-based interface on the Internet to 3D graphic-based interface where we have avatars. And those avatars become portable from one website to another, and it's integrated with artificial intelligence that has a human interface. So think, for example, about buying a car. And you go to a designated website. You picked out the kind of car that you want, um, or you can go to a website that will help you pick out a car. And there you are. Your, your avatar is in the showroom, uh, and it looks at the car, and you can walk around the car, and there's a salesperson there who's another avatar. And you get in the car, and you and the salesperson can go for a test drive, and you can get a sense of what it's like to be in that car. It's obviously not the same as you being in the car, but it, it gives you some idea about the suspension and so forth. All the time you're asking the salesperson questions and the salesperson's answering those questions. And the thing is, you're doing this real time online, 24-7, anytime you want. The salesperson isn't really even there. Okay, The salesperson is just a, an artificial intelligence data bank. So what happens when you ask a question that's not in the data bank? The salesperson is trained to say, let me get back to you on that a message immediately goes to somebody who knows the answer to that. If it's during the, during the day in America, it goes to somebody in the U.S. If it's at night, it goes to somebody in India who's, who's working during the day there. They immediately send back an answer to that. The salesperson says, you know that question you asked me a couple minutes ago about the torque, blah, 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 and then he answers it. Now imagine you do that with legal services, okay? What if, what if somebody asks a question or what if somebody needs legal services, goes to a, an online law office, there's an avatar there, and that avatar isn't even a real person. That isn't even a lawyer. Not, I mean, not only not a lawyer, but not even a real person. So here's what we have right now is we have just answer. We have Q&A stuff that creates a data bank that then can be used again to answer the same questions because I'm sure you all know that we are faced with the same questions when we deal with legal issues day in and day out. So what we have right now is, a, is, is the ability to generate a huge data bank of that. Um, and artificial intelligence has created something so smart that it, that it can beat Ken on Jeopardy. I don't know if you guys watch Jeopardy or not, but Ken Jennings was unbelievable. And Watson from IBM beats him. Uh, and uh, you know, it, it is incredibly advanced um, uh, thinking machine. And then we have A to J, which um, allows us to uh, do this document preparation behind the scenes. And then we have um, our avatars. And if you're familiar with Second Life, you know you can create an avatar in your own image. I'm thinking the image of this guy is that he's, he doesn't have that narrow of a waist, that broad of shoulders, and that much hair. But nevertheless, it looks like him. So, you know, so, so there is this possible future where... People can have interface with the avatars who, who provide legal services, and we're not even there. So how do we govern that? How does that fit into the unauthorized practice of law? How is it when we're behind the scenes of that? All of these things currently exist, and it's just a matter of putting them together right now. And, and that can be done. I'm sure John could probably do that this afternoon if he wanted to. And the question <laughs> is, how, how do we govern that? 
So we're really, you know, our policies are further and further behind the curve on this. And we really need to think them through. We need to watch out for them. And we need to progress in a way that allows us to use the technology to effectively and cost effectively deliver legal services in, in, in a, a quality way um, that might be a little edgy sometimes, but will allow us to get there and hopefully not um, uh, confront the obstacles that might exist um, when we are uh, confronting the UPL and, and the other governance that uh, controls our actions. Questions, comments? Oh my gosh, tons of them. Yeah, <laughs> good. We we've by got no. I, I, and by the way, I know we ran. You know, we had that that audio issue. So uh, you know, I'll be happy to to answer as many questions as I can uh, after the session too. All right, great. And since we. Uh, uh, handled uh, the homework. Um, you know, we, we can we, we might be able to get away with that. No, we have lots of fantastic questions, and in fact, uh, your talk even um, um, what's the word um, anticipated some of these, which I which I always love when that happens. Um, somebody, as a matter of fact, the first question was about um, just answer, and so uh, I think you might have covered it. But here's where uh, you should be able to see them on my screen. Uh huh. Um, yeah. Resources it, it, such as Just Answer Fit In is it's an advice for pay website and will probably helpful would see fraught with parallel. Yeah, yes, absolutely. It is uh, fraught. You know, there's a brand new uh, ethics opinion from South Carolina. Uh, it's twelve three. If you take a look at that, they sanction Q and A sites, um, but they caution. They make two cautions. One is that. It not have uh, O3, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. It it not have um, uh, false and misleading uh, promotional material as part of it that violates the advertising rules. And the second is that the, that the lawyers be cautious against creating an attorney-client relationship when they do that. Very good. So Just this tweeted was... about that today. So <laughs> how how timely. So uh, this is my question, and because I'm not a lawyer, my questions are ignorant. I apologize. But people can be their own lawyers. They can be pro yeah. se. Isn't yeah. that the ultimate defense if someone, you know, uh, for, yeah. for, for, for yeah. UPL? There are uh, virtually every state has an exemption for self-representation, but that's not the business model, I'm, you know, we're, we're looking at here. You're not going to use... Uh, technology, uh, you're not going to develop a technological platform to do uh, document preparation for your own stuff unless you're maybe a, 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 a huge landlord or something like that. Um, but yes, uh, Pro Se uh, is not the, uh, the commission of unauthorized practice of law. It's exempt in virtually, I, I suspect, every jurisdiction, um, either by statute or by court uh, uh, opinion. Um, but it's really not the answer to using technology to create better access to legal services. Yeah, yeah, I hear you, um, but I, I, this question comes out of the whole notion that we're the, the web is a, is enabling a, a maker culture or a DIY culture. You right. know, web WebMD. You know, you can you can go get enormous amounts of medical information. Of course, it's all uh, you know. You really should go see a doctor. You know. If, you know, don't do anything without the advice of your doctor. And right. yet, lots of people self-diagnose, um, not, not to the level of removing their own kidneys, let's hope, and things like that. Right. But still, right. people are doing all sorts of things that normally were uh, exclusively the domain of experts, designing buildings, architecture, um, constructing things and stuff that, um, you know, they're uh, – uh, well, my, my furnace went out this morning, and so what did I do? Call a furnace company? No, I went on the web and watched some YouTube videos on how to how to fix it myself. Right. You know, um, normally, you know, uh, you know, the, the the heating people would say you should only have certified engineers doing that sort of right. Work. And what and what Jensen and Renoso would tell us is that um, the people who created those websites are guilty of the unauthorized furnace repair. <laughs> right. But they were other people like me. They weren't even, right. you know, practicing 
furnace repair people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not sure that makes a difference, but um, it, it might be um, a, a way to. So, so that's a good point. Non lawyers, non lawyers can get in trouble for unauthorized practices of law. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, as as can lawyers who are providing services outside of the jurisdictions in which they're admitted. Sure. Um, this one, this was also my own question. Are there particular dangers for law librarians? I'm thinking. You know, law librarians and clerks are in the same position, and what we created there is is fundamentally a dichotomy between providing legal information and legal advice. And legal information is non-specific, and it is um, typically uh, acceptable, whereas legal advice is responsive to an individual set of facts. And, uh, and and can easily be deemed the unauthorized practice of law. I, I, I can drive trucks through the loopholes in that, but I yeah. get what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, and actually there are um, a series of um, state uh, uh, limitations for clerks mostly um, that are online. Uh, John Grecian has uh, compiled those in some materials, uh, C C I A N, uh, and so you can take a look at um, specifically, you know, what you can do, what you can't do. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Next one is um, how is UPL in cyberspace? For example, an attorney answers a question from a person in another state, in which the attorney is not licensed. Is is that UPL? Yeah. It like I mean, it's, that's, 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 that's yes. <laughs> Yeah, there's no difference between cyberspace and, and telephone or an individual conversation. We are a state-based regulated uh, industry or profession, and uh, th- th- probably the I-, I would guess there are more lawyers who are in violation of UPL than there are lay people, simply because lawyers so frequently are providing services to people in states where they're not admitted. And and where do we see this? We see this in the AMLA 200 firms, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. It's not, it's not the it's not the uh, Main Street lawyers. It's the it's the corporate lawyers who are doing that. Hmm. Um, is there is there a uh, is there a bigger trend here? Are states going to get more lenient about UPL? Are bar associations going to crack down more? I I think you know. Or is it all very mushy? Right yeah. Now? Yeah, it's 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 very mushy, but I think where you see the crackdown is where there's the infringement on the status quo. So, for example, in Illinois, a few years ago, we had an over-the-counter service that was called um, Oh uh, yeah, we the, um, we the people. Yeah, yeah. Right? And we the they people. were providing um, real estate uh, forms, and in, in the real estate uh, bar in Illinois was very aggressive in seeking their. Um, and, and seeking declaration that they were practicing UPL because it was very threatening to that bar. And again, real estate transactional, very compliance oriented. So I think you'll see compliance oriented uh, law practices be um, adverse to uh, the the uh, technological uh, in, impingements um, more so than the. Uh, litigation or dispute resolution practices, but I think that will follow as artificial intelligence becomes something, uh, becomes more sophisticated. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Has the DOJ or FTC said anything about anti-competitive effects of broad definitions of the practice of law as they did when the ABA model definition was under consideration? Yeah, no, not I. I don't, I'm not aware of that. Uh, you know, FTC weighs in from time to time. Not so much DOJ, uh, but the FTC weighs in quite a lot on lawyer advertising, and I don't see them weighing in on other enti- on other legal service providers. It just hasn't come to my attention. Doesn't mean it hasn't happened, but it, I just am not aware of it. So those sleeping giants have not yet been wakened. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, do law schools do and, enough? And, and, you know, and keep in mind, we are a state-based, regulated, you know, court-regulated um, profession, and so um, the FTC is, is is very reluctant to you know do anything other than um, uh, express its opinion. I mean, there's really no bite to the bark there. Yeah, yeah, I see your point. 
Do law schools do enough to no, cover this? Law schools don't ever do enough, right? It's only three <laughs> years and one hundred twenty thousand dollars, right? Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, um, you know, I mean, there, there are. It's part of professional responsibility, you know, and people right. really need to, um, you know, some 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 uh, faculty members teach the test for professional responsibility. Some faculty members are very creative and 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 deal with real world scenarios and 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 some of them obviously include uh, UPL. Now UPL is is prohibited in the model a- ABA model rules of professional conduct. We cannot assist someone who's practicing law without a license, um, and so it is part of that. It's part of that curriculum. Gotcha. Uh, please comment on to. To what extent an attorney whose practice is confined to an area of federal law may engage in the practice of law outside any state or states where she may be admitted? Um, I, I think we, we, we answered that before by saying, yes, that's UPL if you're in one state and online giving advice to somebody else in another state. Yeah, there is, you know, there are ways in which we have authority to cross state lines. And, and so you have to do, you have to find some basis for that authority at Pro Hoc Vice. Is, is the primary example of that. So the question is, is there something that gives you some authority to uh, provide services? Um, I think it's HAC. Um, hack, like pro hack. No, no, pro oh. hack. Oh, <laughs> um, sorry. It's okay. Uh, yeah, V-I-C-E. Um, so... Um, you know, that, that's what you have to do. Is you, even though you have a competence to do that, the question is, you know, can you co-counsel? Can you find some other hook uh, to uh, do that, to, to provide those services in a different state? Gotcha. Um, under diligence, when you zealously advise the client of the right forms to use to affect the client. Uh, I, I don't know how zealously you can tell them which forms to use. Um, yeah, uh, I mean... <laughs> You know, the, the zealous advocacy language is a holdover from a bygone era. Yeah. And I really, frankly, am not that concerned about it. I bring it to attention that it does exist. But, you know, we used to have a requirement of zealous advocacy in our rules. Then it was relegated to the comments. And, frankly, in the advent of Rule 1.2C, which was adopted by the ABA 10 years ago and has been now been adopted by more than 40 states defining the ability to create, um, uh, to, to provide limited scope representation. I really think that that zealous advocacy is inconsistent with that rule in some circumstances, and it's something that is of far lesser concern than the compliance with 1.2C. Gotcha. Um, the previous one didn't seem to be a question as much as somebody giving us some um, some clueful advice. So we'll go on. Um, ghost rating, uh, is that not the same thing, though, as using standard yeah. forms or contract language from form books? Um, I mean, well, the question is, is the lawyer, you know, for, for, for transactional matters, for things out of court, um, yes. It, you know, the question is, is it clear that it's the work product of the lawyer? The, the aggravation for ghostwriting comes into effect when it, there are pleadings that are submitted to the court and whether or not they are um, uh, misrepresented as a pro se client's work, for example. And, gotcha. the courts, and the courts have taken three directions. Some courts have said that the lawyers have to include their name and contact information, which has a tr- chilling effect. Uh, because they're yes. afraid that the courts will bring them in. The other uh, second standard is that lawyers who do the pleadings have to say that they were done by a lawyer, but not that individual lawyer. And the third um, set of states say, you know what, we can tell. We don't need you to tell us it was done by a lawyer. That, that doesn't clarify things at all for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Um, how do, I don't understand this question. Uh, how does the attorney, in fact, power of attorney, avoid the practice of law issues? They're not lawyers. They're, I mean, it's by statute that, you know, attorney, in fact, or, as opposed to attorney at law are two different things defined okay. by statute. I think okay. that's what I believe the answer to that is. Okay. 
And the uh, last one, what about answering a question in another state on AVO? Uh, clients are anonymous, facts limited. AVO has lots of disclaimers. I imagine this is like the just answer um, comment you made earlier. I, I think you do want um, to take a look at that South Carolina opinion. Um, uh-huh. And also, um, it, it seems to me that uh, being anonymous and having limited facts doesn't help you unless you are providing legal information instead of legal advice. So if you're dealing with a fact-specific situation, there's some risk there. I, I frankly can't imagine lawyers doing it with great frequency because of the confidence issue. I mean, unless you know all the nuances. I mean, maybe if you're doing a federally based practice like immigration or bankruptcy, you're in a better position to do that. But it seems to me there's great risk there. Um, yeah, far more risk than reward um, when, when you're addressing people in other states unless you, ha- you know, ha- are, are extraordinarily confident with that. Excellent. Well, Will, thank you very much. That was a, a wonderful presentation. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to do this for us and our students. Um, My pleasure. Great. So, so here's the homework assignment. I, I talked about it at the very beginning, so I'm not going to repeat myself. Um, I will just remind you that next week is our last week of this course. Uh, we've got Ernie Svensson, Ernie the attorney, to talk about social media and law and lawyers, uh, law practice. Um, and uh, I, I will say that the homework will be interesting, um, and we'll have a social media component to it. So thank you very much for uh, you folks attending, and uh, see you all next week. the Center for